is Terry Bradshaw, quarterback, Pittsburgh Steelers. Touched by Downing. Swinging. There's a drive into left center field. That ball is going to be out of here. It's gone. It's 7 15. There's a new home run champion of all time. And it's ABC's Monday Night Baseball, live from Fenway Park in Boston, Massachusetts. He's fading, looking, looking, looking. He's under the gun. He's fired, he throws. It is. This is baseball, Major League Baseball, and this is Mel Allen. Take the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Everybody and welcome to the February 11th, 1974 issue of Sports Illustrated that we're going to be talking about today on the Past Our Prime podcast. I got Bill Mahoney Woo. and Mark Hoffman. Who's he? He's the doofus in between. With the Jeremy's seat. here recording everything and making Hi, everything uh, comes out just right. And if it doesn't, I'll get you his email later. Um, this has Ben Crenshaw. On the cover, um, Ben Crenshaw would go on to become a Hall of Fame golfer. Mm -hmm. He was 22 at the time, had basically just come onto the tour out of a unbelievable amateur career at the University of Texas. Uh, we'll get to that in a in a little bit. We also will be talking a little bit about the NFL WFL draft that took place in 1974 and then we will go on and talk about how the draft has evolved and certain aspects of the football draft now as compared to then with i mean honestly when i say name me a sports agent yeah who comes up that's right lee steinberg, I'm, I'm steinberg. Wire? yeah i grew up <laughs> but i grew up with that name right yeah i, I mean you name. know people who don't know sports yeah they know who lee steinberg yes, they sure is. do and uh, so we got Lee Steinberg joining us in, in a few minutes. Looking forward to that. But uh, going to start with the scorecard section. Mark, you got anything? Well, I think it's really interesting about this NFL draft. And they all talk about that the World League football or World Football League, people don't really know about this league. I mean, some people have heard of a little bit of the USFL that came around in the 80s. Mm -hmm. But this World Football League that came around in the 70s didn't last very long. But it, in some ways, did have a dramatic effect. They wanted to kind of be like the AFL was, where we kind of forced a merger with the NFL, which didn't happen. But the first few games, it was had better numbers than the AFL. It just couldn't sustain itself. But they, before the NFL had their draft, the NFL draft was on January 29th and 30th of 1974. The day before, the World Football League did their draft. So... There were three players. James McAllister was a star at UCLA, Kermit Johnson, and there was a third player from USC, and they all signed with the World Football League before the NFL draft had even happened. Right. Which was kind of like, kind of took the NFL by, by surprise, like, what? Huh? Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting because the three of them, when they were going to their press conference to announce that they had signed, uh, the kid from USC, I want to say, Brown, Booker Brown, right. or something like Booker that. Brown. Uh, they were in a, a 67 Buick, and he said, the car broke down, right? So these kids have no money. And he goes, yeah, we, I was driving a 67 Buick on the way here. He goes, next week, I'll be driving a 1974-something. <laughs> so could, he knew payday was coming, you know? Could, though, could you imagine, like, Bryce Young going, I'm going to be late for the NFL draft because right. my car broke down? Right, right, right. <laughs> I thought it was interesting going back to, to James McAllister is that the NCAA back then, mm -hmm. um, they they made a rule that said, they, they changed the rule that allowed you to be a professional in mm -hmm. one sport and keep amateur status in another. So McAllister was a football player at UCLA and a track and field star. So he then signs with an agent so that he can you know be represented in the in the in the upcoming draft. And the NCAA rules him ineligible for both track and field. And, and he's like, what? what? And they said, well, yeah, we said you could 
become professional. We didn't say you could sign with an agent. And he's like, why don't you tell me that? You know, it's, <laughs> right? The and, agent could only advise. That was the thing. He could only right. advise. He couldn't negotiate. Couldn't negotiate. It's, it's a, and the 19-year-old is like thinking, as he said, he's like, this is really stupid. How is anyone with no knowledge of contract negotiations supposed to deal with men who have spent their lives doing that? And I was just thinking it's good to know that the NCAA has sucked as an yes, organization yes. Even back then. for Our at least life. the last 50 years because there's not a shred of common sense. It's too bad, like McAllister said, well, heck, where's my nil, you know? Yeah. And they never, the NCAA never bends. No. They never, they, no matter what they argument. They have no one to getting, answer wait, to. No one to. No, yeah. but what's really yeah. interesting with this nil now is the NCAA has shot themselves in the foot. And they're not regulating this thing, and it's going out of control. And this is going to be the death of the NCAA. Yeah. But the thing is, you have to ask that to Florida State, who now got in trouble for doing something wrong with the NIL, and they're losing things there. So it's – I don't know what the NCAA, NCAA does. I mean, they I know just, they punish people. A lot of red tape. Just like right? back in those days, they, they just, punish people uh, uh, randomly. They just – anything they touch, they ruin. Yes. Yes, um, arbitrary. Yeah. Arbitrarily ruin kids' careers yeah. or college lives. I think, Billy, you touched on this maybe uh, a week or so ago, but uh, what a year um, Tom Weisskopf had in 1973. It's included uh, in non-PGA Tour events that he won the most money, $350,000 okay. um, ever, more than Jack Nicklaus, yeah. who won 341000 the year before, prompting Mark McCormick, the sport's leading money manager, to say that, no one will break Jack Nicholas's money record for many years, at least 10, maybe never. <laughs> now, I think the winner of a major oh. is like almost $3 million, yes, $2.6 million for John Rahm or something close but to that. But in the so. major, some of the, the, the ones that finished 20th sometimes get a oh, bigger oh, payday. Oh, for sure they that. do. So. Sure they do. The purse has just grown exponentially. So. Go. No one, no one uh, could predict the no. future on that. Um, anything else from the scorecard well, from you guys? You guys want to talk about, I'm not sure if we can, the honey shot? Oh. Yes. Uh, oh, oh my gosh. That, yeah. Who knew? Yeah, and, Andy's, and someone to be responsible Andy for. Andy Sedaris man. had quite the job back for ABC Sports in the day. But he gave the list of the, what he called the people at the time. You think, oh my God, it would never go over. Yeah, just so you guys know, he was basically in charge in the broadcast of ABC's college football games of going through the stands with, a, you know, with the cameras would pan the crowds and he would look for quote unquote honey shots, which basically means the cute girls in the stands that they want to get shots of at different types times of the game um and they asked him um his his opinion on yeah. certain places that were good for this and not so good yeah 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 you ripped on buffalo and detroit you did yeah in buffalo he said the girls looked like plant foreman <laughs> yes. and in and in detroit they looked like alex Karos in a wig yes C could yes. you imagine if he tried that today yeah yeah uh, alex Karos, for those who don't know Played 15 years in the NFL. Really? He was 6'2", 250. So apparently the, the woman in Detroit, um, he later was a broadcaster, famously played Mongo in Blazing in Saddles, Blazing Saddles Br Mel Brooks's classic. So, yeah. And the TV series Webster. That is right. That's right. But he just, I mean, I mean, it, it, Andy just, he... Um, he didn't like uh, the Big Ten. No, he didn't. And he, he, ranked, the, he ranked the schools by beauty. And then to finish it, I guess for him, in later later on in life when he got out of TV, he started specializing in action flicks ah. that featured booksome, gun-toting playboy playmates and penthouse pets with titles like "Fit to Kill" and "Savage Beach." Ah. Beach. So, so that working for ABC was his prep work. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah. evidently, yeah, evidently, too feminist. Yes, yeah, yeah. He said of Stanford. Oh, uh, he yeah, said the yeah. Northern California girls <laughs> that the, the dividing line was Bakersfield. If yeah. you were south of Bakersfield, he liked that. If you're north of Bakersfield, not so good. So he said of Stanford, we concentrate on just the game. All we found there were girls dressed in a style I can only describe as early war 1812. And I thought there's, you know, Andy knows a thing or two about living in 1812. Yeah, evidently. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he the Minnesota said the style is early lumberjack. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's unfair. That's I think they were more 
more mid mid century late lumberjack. Yes. To say yes. they were early yeah. lumberjack early. is just demeaning. That's just not fair to Paul Bunyan. Yeah. <laughs> That's you know about right. But uh, the, the other, I just find so fascinating about the this issue too is this whole you know World Football League is just I mean did any people even remember the teams? No. You know, well, no, I do. No. Uh, well, first of all, we you know we had Larry Zonka on a couple weeks ago. Right. And he talked about uh, signing with. With Memphis, Memphis, the South, and I lived in Memphis at the time, as a seven-year-old. So that was a huge deal when when Zonka, Kick, and Warfield signed with them, and and was a real wake-up call to the NFL as to like, oh, this is serious. Because at first they were kind of like, eh, run along, and then well, that that takes us to to the to the first story. Go ahead. But but do you remember the LA team? What the LA team was? I do not. Do not. It was called the Southern California Sun. And oh. uh, I think they played in Anaheim, but I remember because it would be their games would be televised locally. I can't remember which local station did it, but they had the worst. It was like magenta and orange and pink. Their uniforms were just like blind you. Did Yikes. you go to a game? Nope, I did not. Oh, okay. But I remember watching one. Oh, no. Full of sound and fury is the first article in this issue, and it is on the NFL draft. Um, and I think it's just funny about how the guy who wrote the the article was not a fan of the NFL yeah. draft. Mm-hmm. He did not think it was going to last. Um, he had all the suspense of an I Love Lucy episode. That's right? right. That's right. Right. I mean, you know, and, and granted, uh, you know, it was not what it is today. It was not a televised event. Um, like uh, back in those days, it was business. It was just now. Business. Now it's a show. You know, yeah. You know, even in the 80s, the draft would be during the middle of the week. It would be like it would start like at eight o'clock East Coast time. Mm-hmm. So we would have to get up and like say if we were covering the Rams draft, we would have to drive down to the Rams headquarters in Orange County at like five in the morning and sit around and wait for John Robinson to come out and talk about the pick or whatever it was. Yeah. So it was even then it wasn't this big event, but obviously now it's huge. But back then. You know. Back then, they were the players that were picked. You had heard of them. They were just names. Right. Nowadays, the first guy that's drafted, you even the thirtieth guy that's oh, drafted, yeah, you know sure. them for from the sure. day they were born yes. to all the way up till yeah. now. The draft uh, second round, New York Giants take Tom Mullen, guard, Southwest Missouri State, and it's nice to know that one tradition was started right at that point, as two hundred fans at the hotel began booing, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is a New York uh, rite of passage. Um, he did play five years in the NFL and was done, so um, uh, a nice NFL career for him, but not the star player that the Giants fans were hoping for. Writer Joe Marshall said the rat the draft doesn't work. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Mm. He then explains how it works. With the worst team, the Houston Oilers, they pick first in each round, and the Super Bowl champion Dolphins pick last in each round. I mean, it's just so hard to believe that that they had to explain that to their readers back then, that, you know, they, this is the chronological order of how we're going to draft. But didn't he also want to – he said the draft could be different if you put, like, Houston would go number one in the first round, and then the then the then whatever team had two wins would go – I mean, yes. it was really convoluted. It, was, it made it even ten times worse than it was. He really wanted to make it uh, equitable. Yes. You know, and – That I the mean, good teams know, basically got Why nobody. would the good teams get punished for, for being good? Yes. They get punished anyway by picking last in each right. round. Right, they don't need any more um, punishment. You know, you can't police bad organizations. They're bad for a reason. Yeah, he did. He said Miami picks 26th with the last pick of the first round and Houston 27th with the first pick in the second round. Mm-hmm. And with that difference, there's only one spot difference. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, that's not true. Houston picks first in the round. Miami 26th, there's 25 right. picks difference difference in each round it's not miami's fault that houston traded away most of those picks and um look uh 50 years later they're still doing it pretty much the same way yeah yeah um i mean now like you said billy there's mock drafts i yeah. mean there's yeah. mock drafts right for years yeah, down yeah. Yeah. Not just three years um, from now. Yeah. Uh, mel kuyper jr has yes. become a household name in in sports in the sports world for his just by doing the draft just talk right. about his hair that right. was the thing you should talk about his hair dude now yeah. it's you he know, got draft into arguments expert. yep with um with was it bill poland i forget who it was the indianapolis yeah, Colts, right. yeah. uh general manager called him out to task i think mel kuyper was right in that scenario so um, but uh, this draft in particular in 74, like you said, they had to deal with the WFL. 
and the WFL could just go sign guys. Mm -hmm. So the NFL was having to not only draft guys, but then get into negotiations almost immediately mm -hmm. because they were afraid that these guys, one, maybe they weren't even available. So that was the thing. You could draft a guy that had already signed with the WFL, and there's a wasted pick. So they were freaking out right. about that. And then the other one was, you know, they were like, okay, we drafted you. Now let's sign them, you know. So it really benefited the, the players right away because you know, they had they had leverage finally. So the NFL was concerned about drafting guys that uh, that they could that they could sign a little quicker mm -hmm. than than normal. Right. And joining us now is someone who knows a little bit about the NFL draft and how it has evolved over the years. He has represented the number one overall pick in the NFL a record eight times. His client list is a who's who of players, Steve Young, Troy Aikman, Bruce Smith. Trust me, I could go on. Lee Steinberg. To think this all started, Lee, when you represented a guy who lived uh, in your dorm, I believe, or at least on the same floor, a buddy of yours, Steve Bartkowski, when he was the top pick of the 1975 draft. And, I mean, I say this in all seriousness, you were just a kid, 25 years old. How did the WFL impact those first negotiations? So um, I was student body president at, at Cal when uh, Ronald Reagan was governor of California. And every time we demonstrated, he would crack down. And I learned everything about the art of leverage and negotiating from dealing with uh, then governor, later president Reagan. And I was a dorm counselor in an undergrad dorm and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm. And Steve Bartkowski in 1975 was the very first player picked in the first round of the NFL draft. So there I was brimming with legal experience, <laughs> not having to correct the law before. And I had the first overall pick and the World Football League was competing against the NFL. And so by having two options, Bartkowski was able to get the largest rookie contract in NFL history. Um, but it was a very rudimentary field. There was no guaranteed right to represent a player then. A team could just hang up the phone and say, we don't deal with agents. So um, from the start in 1975, if Rip Van Winkle had gone to sleep in 1975 and woke up to this world of sports, he'd be in total culture shock. I, I've got to ask, Lee, this is Steve Barkowski's on your dorm. He's on your floor. You go get another job. He calls you and says, can you represent me? What is the feeling? You had never done something like that. That had to be, I mean, be blown away. What was your feeling at the time when he asked you? No. I'm, did you say no? <laughs> <laughs> the reason I told you about the Berkeley experience was the fact that Berkeley at that point was the center of student culture, um, you know, long hair, tie-dye, herbal substances, rock music. And so being president was like being the governor of a state. So that was a pretty broad um, canvas. And um, I, I love sports, but there was no field to aspire to because it didn't exist. Um, and uh, so I thought, sure. In the Sports Illustrated article, it talks about the NFL draft at 74, which back then was held in late January over two days. And it said there was like no suspense. Uh, the Vikings, I think, were represented by their equipment manager. Um, that 74 draft, and that's the year that you pass the bar and, and you start your agency. Um, how, like, is, does it bog your mind to think of what that draft was like back then as to what it is like now? There was no way to follow the draft at that point. It wasn't carried live on any media. It um, You sort of had to wait until the phone call came from the team. And um, the next day, people would read about who got drafted. That's morphed into this extravaganza that goes on for a week with uh, 
uh, fans in the city by the hundreds of thousands attending and um, and all sorts of programming and uh, just the, the NFL has done an excellent job sustaining interest in the off season. So um, yeah, those were rudimentary uh, 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 drafts. When you when you first started, what is it you could get? I remember I've heard your name since I was a, a young guy. And uh, when you come to picking a client, what do you look for in a client? Not just dollar signs. What are you looking for? So I was raised by a father who had two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was try to make a meaningful impact in the world in a positive way and help people who can't help themselves. So I was looking for a career where I could make a difference and an impact. In that very first um, arrival at Atlanta, I saw that, well, first we get there and there are fleet lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd's pressed up against the police line. And the first thing we hear is, we interrupt the late news to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and Lee Steinberg as attorney have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live. So I understood then that athletes were the movie stars. They were the subjects of idol worship and veneration, that they um, had this impact. And I thought, well, um, I would want to represent athletes who had a social conscience, a big heart, who understood their power uh, with that profile to leave a legacy. People who would go back to the high school community, set up a scholarship fund or work with the Boys and Girls Club, but put down roots, do the same thing at the collegiate level and get close to the uh, alumni group and maybe do a scholarship or weight room. And then as a pro level, set up a charitable foundation um, that would tackle a cause the athlete cared about. And we get the leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders on the board to execute the program. So it's a war done who put the 200 single mother and her family in the first home they'll ever own. It's a self-starter. Um, as an athlete, what you look for is how does that athlete perform in adversity? So... You look at a quarterback and he's thrown a couple interceptions in the game. The crowd's starting to boo. The game's getting out of hand. Um, what does he do then? Can he compartmentalize, adopt a quiet mind, and elevate his level of play in critical circumstances to take the team to and through victory? Because most athletic contests now are coming down to the fourth quarter. Uh, or even the last drive or the last play. So the question is, from a skill set standpoint, can they do that? From a, do, is this someone ambitious for second career? Can I do with them what I did with um, Steve Young and Brent Jones, which is to have them network to people in Silicon Valley to the point where they're both leaders of hedge funds? Can we get an athlete who's forward foresight looking. So I would profile them, read about them, get to know their parents and understand who that human being was. You know, you, you mentioned um, the relationships. And just as an example, one of them, um, Troy Aikman. Um, so you develop, you know, you're not just getting these people set for life and, and representing them as a football player, but as a person. What is your relationship like with just for an example, like a Troy Aikman? I mean, how close do you get with these? These people have to become your friends. They do. And someone like Warren Moon and I went together 23 years because he played six in Canada and 17 in the NFL. So you get very close. And I think the most important skill in life is the ability to listen and draw out another human being. So the first stage with a potential client is to create enough space and safeness so they're willing to peel back the layers of the onion until you finally get to what is someone's 
deepest anxieties and fears and what are their greatest hopes and dreams. If you can put yourself in the heart and mind of another human being and see the world the way that person sees it, then you can work your way gracefully through life. So I needed to have a deeper understanding of not what was politically correct or the safe answer, but how did that athlete feel about short-term economic gain, long-term economic security, family, spiritual values, geographical location, profile, and then being on a winning team, the quality of coaching. Um, how did all that fit together uniquely in that person's life? Mm -hmm. So I needed to know Troy as he psychologically existed inside himself, not the surface Troy. Mm -hmm. In 1974, there was no cell phones, no texting, no social media. Is it harder to be an agent today, easier, the same? I, th I think it's um, harder because the proliferation of uh, multiple platforms, a content supply and the ubiquitous nature of the cell phone um, causes a lack of uh, patience and an inability to focus that I think is harder uh, today than, than it was then. Yes, we had to go to a phone booth. Someone can remember that. And we had rotary phones. What? And no one ever, <laughs> ever dreamed of a, of a computer. Busy signals. Uh, yes. <laughs> but, you know, it, it put a premium on being face-to-face. -face and um, now you have people whose whole existence is texting, right? Mm -hmm. And someone will text someone else something that they find mildly provocative. And so they get angry and text back, and then that person texts back, and now it accelerates. So all of a sudden, you have a text war where nothing was wrong with the relationship in the first place. You know, it's public knowledge um, for that, uh, Lee, that you have been sober now for over 10 years now. Um, you hit, uh, according to Troy Aikman, the proverbial rock bottom, and he said it's just a great comeback story, Lee lost pretty much everything he had for him to be where he's at and resurrect his career. I think that's the greatest thing he's ever done. Is he right? Oh, I think, I hope the greatest thing I've ever done is to the impact we've had on athletes and their value system and the ability together to tackle problems like sex trafficking, domestic violence, bullying, uh, the environment, um, and, and to make a difference. But um, it's, um, when people talk about a comeback, my quote comeback is that in March, I'll be 14 years continuously sober, and uh, I've been a, a good parent. And after that, everything else is sort of the cherry on top. And uh, but I just didn't understand much about alcoholism. And um, before I knew it, um, I had uh, uh, was struggling. And and if there's anyone out there who's in a similar circumstance and you're desperate or hopeless or depressed, just no help's available. There are 12 step programs where uh, uh, with a unique fellowship that will uh, help guide you through it. And uh, uh, notwithstanding how dark and foreboding your environment is now, um, you can get to a brighter future. What's the first advice you give to a client? You meet with a client, the very first thing you will say to them. That the engine that pulls the train in all this is your performance and play on the field. And that you're part of a public entertainment, which is not the same as having to have a car or, or food on the table. That they've got the necessity to comport themselves in a reasonable way because the fans after all are the ultimate employers. And so they have to make up their mind uh, from the beginning that, um, they have to be careful behaviorally um, and uh, and focus on this moment. Um, instead of thinking about ultimate results, stay in process. 
keep doing those things that will get you ultimately, whether it's preparation practice, will get you ultimately to the result, but don't obsess in it now. It, 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 uh, just stay in process. Now, if you, uh, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Your first contract with Bartkowski, I think, was 600000 And I read that you did the contract with Mahomes, which is over 500 and some million. The money it has, has really obviously expanded. Did you recognize that at the time that that was going to happen? And can, in the future, you picture negotiating a billion-dollar contract? Oh, absolutely. To your latter question, yes. Um, it it I could predict it in baseball when I started was a dominant sport. Now, now football is as dominates American culture. It's the most popular television show, um, not just the most popular sport. But I could see that football had an immediacy, contact once a week play. So you could lead in and out of it. And that one day is the television rights is once television started to expand beyond three networks and a couple independents to multiple um, stations and networks, I knew that the rights fees would go through the roof because um, sports delivers and most people have to watch the broadcast live right because your chance of taping it and having no one tell you the score is not real great so you know the commercials are going to run at that time and it became a loss leader where fox used nfl football to highlight its monday through friday broadcast program so the bottom line of the network exploded and so the bidding's not rational so i could see tv was coming and i could see stadia were going to be much more um ancillary revenue producing with uh, luxury boxes and naming rights and so i sort of tried to help the sport get there uh, by talking to owners about what i thought was possible you look back now on your career, and like I said, you started as a, as a young 25-year-old, and now 50 years later, are, are there a couple things that stand out that, that, that just, you know, you're just so blessed and grateful for? Um, well, having the clients I had, but um, the ability to do things like stand at a banquet that Warren Moon was having for his Crescent Moon Foundation. And he asked people in the audience to stand up if they'd gone to college on a scholarship he provided. Mm. And you look around the room and one by one, these hundreds of kids get, um, uh, and you're able to see the actual impact of what these programs can do. And again, it's Lennox Lewis cutting a public service announcement that says real men don't hit women, um, which does more to trigger imitative behavior in rebellious adolescents towards the issue of domestic violence than a thousand authority figures ever could. It's um, the work we've done on concussion. Um, it's not simply defining representing an athlete as putting more dollars in his bank book. But I had a crisis of conscience back in the 80s. I'm representing half the starting quarterbacks in the NFL. They keep getting hit in the head. And no doctor can tell us when they should retire, how many, too many, uh, anything about it. So I've now held uh, about 20 concussion conferences where we've broken ground on solution. Um, so it's aspects uh, like that. And in my own life, it's education of younger people. We do agent academies to bring young people with principles and ethics into the profession. We teach them how to negotiate, how to, how to recruit, how to uh, set up a charitable foundation, how to market, how to brand. And I've done a series of educational programs with younger people from different ethnic backgrounds to bring the races together and training and um, pushing back against skinheads. So it's all that. Is there one client you work with that you're most proud of? And maybe it's not a big name. Maybe it's someone that no one's heard of, but that gives you the, the 
most sense of pride and joy? You know, early in my career, there was a place kicker named Rolf Bernerska Rolf. Who, for the San Diego Chargers. And we put together the seminal program, which he cared about endangered species at the San Diego Zoo. So we put together a program called Kicks for Critters, where every field goal he kicked, he gave money to the zoo and for endangered species. And we had posters and pledge cards proliferate throughout the community. So you walked into a 7-Eleven poster pledge card. Little kids collected cans for critters. Mm. And we actually saved endangered species that directly got funded by the research. Um, but Warren Moon and I were together the longest for 23 years. Uh, he played in Canada, and then he played 17 in, in the NFL. And, uh, you know, he set up scholarship fund at his high school and the scholarship fund at University of Washington and all the rest of it. And we sort of grew up together. I was reading and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say I watched Jerry Maguire. So I have to say that. <laughs> but you had compared your life to another movie. Can you explain that? You can, I read that you compared your your life to Forrest Gump. Why, why was that? <laughs> Well, on Jerry Maguire, uh, the writer, director, Cameron Crowe, called me up back in 1993 and said he wanted to follow me around to pick up atmosphere for a film that would center on a sports agent. So he came to the NFL draft with me where I had the first pick. He came to a press conference with Bill Parcells. He came to the league meetings in uh, Palm Desert. He came to games. He came to my Super Bowl parties, and he spent time in my office, and I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. And then I had to vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a motion picture, so you don't think the uh, dialogue's phony or the look is phony, um, uh, got captured. And then he gave me athletes like Cuba Gooding Jr., to take to the Super Bowl in Phoenix, and I had to make him pretend to be a uh, pretend to be uh, uh, my football client. So it's been 25 years of people coming up to me at an airport or out to dinner, where they either say four words to me or ask me to say them to them, which start with "Show me the money." money. So, um, uh, but Forrest Gump was just that the, you know, I grew up and had a grandfather who ran Hillcrest Country Club, which had, you guys are a little young, but but Jack Benny and George Burns and Gretchen Marks and, and uh, uh, Bob Hope and all those people. I went to my first baseball game with George Burns and my grandfather. Uh, and then I'm in Berkeley in the middle of what seems to be what's happening in the United States. Then we go to Atlanta and guess who's running for president out of Atlanta? It's Jimmy Carter, right? And it just has gone on and on like that with uh, uh, more random uh, uh, relationships and occurrences that just somehow end up in the middle of things. I heard you met Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison. Boy. So when I was uh, student president of... Uh, of uh, Cal, people would come to the campus because they wanted to be on the cutting edge. They wanted to be in the vortex of what was happening in student life. And so one day, Jimi Hendrix came to my office and said, I want to catch the vibe. Can you tell me what's going on here? And and I walked him around Berkeley. And then another day, Jim Morrison came. And it was just one after another. It was Gloria Steinem and, and uh, Timothy Leary. And and you, you would meet these interesting uh, people. So, so, Lee, we do a segment on the show called 50-50. And we give the guests a 50% chance at answering our trivia question from 50 years ago. So your trivia question is 50 years ago, the number one movie in the country was The Way We Were with Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford. But the third lead in that movie was a character actor named Bradford Dillman. True or false, Bradford later, after acting, became, wrote several football books and even was an Italian evaluator for the San Francisco 49ers. That sounds pretty phony, but I'll guess yes. Yes. Now, I don't know about how we can take the Italian evaluator, but the story goes, in the 1986 draft, Bill Walsh, he got to sit in on the drafts with the Niners, 
And Bill Walsh turned to him and said, for the very last pick, it was like in the 10th round, go ahead and make the pick. And he picked a nose tackle from Auburn named Harry Hallman, who he thought would be a linebacker. And Hallman never played in the NFL, but he did have a long career in the CFL. But uh, that is the trivia question nice. for the day. And you got it. Nice. And for that, you get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lee, I just want to finish. I need, I need, I need a good agent. Yes, you that's right. Yes. I, I, I know someone. <laughs> I wanted to say, you know, you said everyone comes up to you and they say uh, four words. But the, the, the funny part about that is that quote is not from Jerry Maguire. That is from Cuba Gooding's character. And I think it's interesting that the four words I would attribute to you would be help me help you, because mm. that sounds much more like something Lee Steinberg would say. Or you had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of good yeah. ones in that one, isn't there? <laughs> you know, I kept saying it could have been worse. You could have been Jay Moore's character. <laughs> but um, exactly. And uh, uh <laughs> I helped him on the set of of, of the movie because uh, he was uh, a composite of all my worst dreams. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Hey, you could do worse than have Tom Cruise uh, play play uh, play you. That's yes. for sure. Lee, this has been so fun. We appreciate your time. A giant in the industry, one of the pioneers in the uh, yes. sports agents of, of the world. So thank you for your time, and uh, congratulations uh, this coming March on 14 years. That's, that's something thank to really you. put your hat on. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. You know, to think he was just 25 when he represented Steve Bartkowski and – 50 years later, he talked about his dad and his dad having those two um, mottos to live by and to be able to do that, to be able to make such an impact, not just for his own self, uh, his family, his clients. But I mean, my God, when he talks about Warren Moon telling people to stand up mm -hmm. because Warren Moon got these people scholarships into college. Right. I don't know how. I mean, that's so moving. It's about not just, hey, I'm signing you this contract to be this athlete, mm -hmm. but it's like more than that. Now you have sort of – you have a little bit of power and you have some responsibility, and there's more that you can do than just play sports. You could affect other people's lives. He just – yeah, he, he wanted men. He wanted he wanted people that he knew were going to be good men, and, and I – there's just not enough of that. There's not enough of that. No. Um but I also love the fact that he said there might be a billion dollar contract. Yeah. That is just from where we came from, the day when the players had to have second jobs. Right. Now, right. I think it's just. That was the beginning. Otani's 70% of the way there. All right. But I, I got to ask. I remember like when Ricky Henderson signed, I want to say a three year, three million dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's a million dollars a year, well, you know, and it was. You know, that's only 35 yep. years ago. Well, I mean, the, you know. the Angels wouldn't give Nolan Ryan yeah. he, he money. Signed, he signed recently, I saw this, like in 74, mm -hmm. $100,000. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I remember in the early 90s, Will Clark signed with the Giants, four years, $16 million, And I thought, oh, my God, that's insane, $4 million. Yeah, how can they pay that? someone that yeah. much? And now it's... A utility player makes that now. But I still, and I, he, didn't, he didn't touch on it as much. But to me, the thing, Scott, you were in junior college. If all of a sudden... You come out of junior college, and Monday Night Football comes. So you know a guy because you met him in, at Glendale CC or whatever. They came to you and said, Scott, you need to produce. Uh, can you produce Monday night? That's to me like Lee Steinberg. He wasn't ready to negotiate a guy's contract. The thought that, that – I don't want to say luck because it's not luck with him. But I'm just saying just that thought of – you come out, a friend calls you, goes, yeah, I've been drafted number one. Can you negotiate for me? That's just amazing. Right. Like I said, you said, you asked him. Yeah. And I I thought a lot of people would say, no. No, exactly. I can't do that. Yeah. Are you crazy? Obviously, he was wicked smart. There's my Boston but, coming out for yeah. you, people. But, he, but you know, he, he, he must have known he could do it. Well, and he also came out at the right time. Because, like, if you became a sports agent, say, in 1950, you're not going to affect this kind of change from 50 to – you know, 1970, but starting in the mid 70s, oh, everything starts to right. change. And but to think also that he said, uh, and I think it was uh, Mike Brown of the Bengals. Yes, yeah. That would just hang up on. 
on agents. Yeah, he wouldn't let he wouldn't he wouldn't talk. What is he representing McAllister or something? And he was just hung up on. Yeah, nope. and then he had to go to like McAnally or whatever of the Colts. And I kept thinking, yeah, they didn't have to talk to you. No, if you did, you know, they said no agent. Yeah, you know, but I just, you know, I just, I just think about like a Steinberg. I mean, all these guys, but the, the stories he must have. And but, I don't mean like dirt. I just mean like the the Warren Moon. Yeah, one. he must have. Hundreds of those stories. where where, yeah. where people have made just like he said that we just you know that we don't know about. And the thing is, is he's represented obviously football, Major League Baseball, uh, NBA. I don't know if he's ever represented any podcast type people, but I know three people. If, you know, get a hold of him maybe. Yeah. To, you know, go to some or certain stations. We would take a couple million maybe. Much, much, much less. Yes. <laughs> I got you 50 bucks. <laughs> we'll start somewhere between 50 bucks and a million. <laughs> somewhere, exactly. <laughs> got 52, and I'm going to the bank now. The Winter Nationals. Mm. Let's move on. The I, uh, I, Big Noise Blew In from Pomona. I have such fond memories of the Winter National, and I'm not a drag racing kind of guy. But I would go down and cover it, and I always had a blast going down to Pomona. And I'd always remember, I'd always get, like, whoever won the top fuel division or funny car to come on the CBS on the show as a guest. But, like, my memories were Joe Gibbs was big into auto racing after uh, um, football. And I remember going down there and, and interviewing Gibbs and, and you know, the drivers that he represented in his mm-hmm. cars. And then in this article they talk about uh shirley cha-cha maldani yeah, right. who is one of the first like female athletes it's like probably one of the greatest right it's one of the first female athletes that was a star and a name and i remember making the movie heart like a wheel right with uh, mm-hmm. uh bonnie bedelia and yep. stuff like that uh but uh just great movie great memories of uh going down in the noise and you had to hold your ear because it was loud but down there in Pomona. Yeah, Shirley uh, said about the um, the funny cars that mm-hmm. the the engines in the top fuel cars are behind the driver. In the funny cars, they're in front, and she used to do funny cars. Yeah. And she said the reason she stopped doing funny cars is because when the engine explodes in the funny car, it explodes in your face. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and she had major burns in Indianapolis not too long be- prior to this. Um suffered you know severe burns in this funny car so she was like you know i'm gonna get in the cars where the engine if it explodes is behind me so you know but she's she, a smart woman she said that, that, that when, when you come to the end the front end tips up and the driver is no longer steering the car but is led by it and at the end of the race they tend to lose weight and become airborne yeah literally fly and i kept thinking like a parachute yes yeah, S- sounds like man. a real safe profession yeah. yes Boy. crazy yeah uh Steve Platt, I'm I'm guessing outside of his family and a, and a few friends, nobody has heard of Steve Platt. Mm-hmm. At the time this came out, he was the third all-time leading scorer in collegiate history. Pete Maravich was number one. Mm-hmm. Um, he averaged 39 and a half points per game. He was 26 years old, and the funny story about this is he was a college student and a farmer Mm -hmm. the reason he was 26 years old is he quit college because he had a wife and kids and he needed to farm the land so he did that and then later came back and went to huntington college um which was a conservative college um most famous alum at the time was a guy named chris shankle uh, a sports broadcaster who uh, put a, an athletic fund to the school where the students were not permitted to drink, dance, or smoke. Everybody footloose. <laughs> um, but anyway, this Platt guy, I mean, listen to this. His his day con, con, con started at like 5 in the morning. He would milk the cows or whatever. Then he would have breakfast at 7.30. Then he would go to class from 9 to 12, come back after class, have lunch, do the fields, go to practice, come home, do homework, go to bed. I mean, it was just a, a crazy world. And to think that he was averaging almost 40 a game. And that was NAIA. NAIA. Right? That's is, right. 
But That's what's right. interesting is that, you know, he actually got drafted by the Washington Bullets mm -hmm. in the eighth round of the 74 draft and stuff. And then he later coached his alma mater. He did. Yes, very well, I might yeah. add. Uh, and this is a funny one. When his wife was pregnant with their second child, he got word that she went into labor and quit a tournament game mm -hmm. uh, with it with the game going on, drove and met his wife at the hospital. The baby was born at midnight. Steve had an hour of sleep before getting up the next morning at 5 a.m. to do his chores. That night, he went back and played in the final of the tournament game and scored 40. Wow. <laughs> the way I, you know, I, I, it's a different era. How Sports Illustrated found these stories. Right. There's no way to look them up. There's it wasn't a newspaper or something that came out and said go see him. That is just that type of reporting. I mean, that guy was in basically the middle of nowhere, right? And the fact he's a farmer, a father, and a heck of a great basketball player right. is is just. I wonder, I wonder if these small towns would call them up and say, "Hey, I got a great yeah, story right. for maybe. you." Maybe, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you know, call you... the local station. Right, and, right, yeah. right, right. Uh, yeah, he uh, coached for 15 years. Uh, he's still to this day in the top 20 of mm -hmm. all time mm -hmm. scorers in collegiate history. Um, he passed um, yeah. not long ago. And Huntington president, Dr. Sherilyn Emberton, said that Coach Platt's legacy lives on as an inspiration for all who knew him as a shining example of using each of our God given gifts to the fullest. Throughout his time at Huntington University, he applied his work ethic to everything he did, farming, coaching, basketball, and developing young people as leaders and pursuers of excellence. And you're right. We've lost a little bit of that because you yeah. just don't – that ain't on Twitter. No. no. You know, no. a guy who had an impact on a lot of people's lives. So I love those kind of stories. I do too. I really enjoyed that. Just yeah. thought, man, mm -hmm. here's a kid, man that's, you know, that had his priorities right. Yeah, and you know, I tell you, when when the alarm for me goes off at five a.m., yes, I turn it off and I go back to sleep. And I roll over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would happen nowadays? Just pick any any pick UCLA right now. If all of a sudden in the middle of the game, one of the UCLA players walked off because his wife was having a baby, it'd be, yeah, it'd be everywhere. You know, what's he doing? He's got a team. Everyone would it would literally be probably split, but there'd be a lot of people wouldn't be happy about that. Yeah. The cover story this week is, um, as we mentioned uh, off the top, Ben Crenshaw, mm -hmm. make way for the kid. He was 22 years old. He looked like he was 17. Good-looking guy. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is perfect Sports Illustrated at the time. They said he was small, not a midget, right. but small, yeah, five, five foot nine. nine. 165 pounds, right? I'm glad that they... Thanks. You know. Who does that describe? <laughs> there you go. Well, you're not a midget. <laughs> Evidently. Um, so, four years earlier, as an amateur, um, he shot 75 on a difficult day at the U.S. Open. He was brought into the media tent, mm -hmm. and, and they mm -hmm. asked him to go through his scorecard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought, this is just perfect. He's 18 years old, and he goes, oh, okay, well... I got a four, and then a four, and then a three, and then a, and the media started laughing, thinking that he was joking. I don't think he was joking. He didn't quite realize that he meant go through he your answered round. answered the question. And, yes, he told them. He went through his uh, – um, but uh, his good yeah. looks and his talent made right. him an immediate favorite. Um, and, I'm, you know, he went on to become a Hall of Fame golfer. Right. I mean, he won 19 PGA events, but what I find remarkable is – so. Uh, he won, I think, two, four, six majors, okay? The first major he won in 1975. The last major he won, 1995. 20 year separation. 20 year span. Which is pretty remarkable. That shows remarkable. you how young he was, too, right. at the beginning. Right. Um, and he was good right from the get go. He won the first tournament um, he ever played in as a pro. And that's not surprising because if you look at, at his fresh uh, at his NCAA career, he mm -hmm. wins the NCAA championship as a freshman. First guy to ever do that. Wins it again as a sophomore, yep. wins it again as a junior. Only two guys have won three NCAA championships, the other being lefty Phil Mickelson. Right. So, so yeah, just a, a, a great a great player. Um, the the ladies really they 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 were known as uh, Ben's Wrens, and they would follow him around on the course um, because he was a, a good looking young lad. Uh, he was walking around with a couple of older guys on the tour, and uh, the reporter asked, um, 
you know, oh, why are you following these guys? And they were like, we don't know who those guys are. <laughs> we're here because that's Ben Crenshaw. <laughs> so, so he had, um, you know, a star is born, uh, two-time winner of the Masters and a member of the World Golf Hall of Fame. Nicknamed so. Gentle Ben. Yeah. Gentle Ben. And yeah. considered one of the best putters in golf history. Is that right? Yeah. They start out with a lot of pressure, though, because they started to compare him to Arnold Palmer. And Jack Nichols. Even yeah. back in the day, they would take a golfer and go, you're just as good as him. Right. That's a lot to put on a 20-year-old, yeah. you know, 20, whatever, 21-year-old And kid. the thing that stinks about something like that when they do that to a 22-year-old is Ben Crenshaw had an unbelievable career. Yeah. yeah. And yet, yeah. it didn't match up to Jack no, Nichols. No, when you set it up so like what? that, you look back So what? That, yeah. Well, you were supposed to be that guy, you know. Yeah. You, you know what? Today, someone will say, Here's the next Ben Crenshaw. Right? Yeah, they will. You know, and that there's nothing at all wrong with that. Nobody cares who's the tenth best player in a sport or the tenth best player in whatever. All they care about is who's number one and maybe who two or three is because they were competing for yeah. one. Uh, did you guys read the thing about the snow caves? I liked that. That was very interesting. That was crazy. Yeah, did yeah. did you read? So it? I'm thinking. I read. I wrote all the what they what they needed to do. Here. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking. So it's an article on guys. Uh, they they would teach people how to build snow caves. Mm-hmm. So obviously you're out in the middle of the of, of Wyoming. I think it was. It was and wasn't it Wyoming? I thought it was, it was Yellowstone. Uh, well, okay, Yellowstone. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, and th- when I think snow cave, I think something that's just large enough to fit me. That's <laughs> right. No, 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 no. Uh, no, they had you had the doorway had to be six to eight feet wide, dug slightly uphill. The entrance had to be domed, shored up with snow arches to keep the cave from sinking. The sleeping chambers must be higher than the entrance, otherwise, wind and the blowing snow can make things miserable inside. My God, the snow is heavy, it's like digging coal. And you had to direction, you had to, you also had to learn how to do directions without a compass. And light, clean, and repair the camp stoves. This was no joke. I mean, there's no- and they had to pay but, to have- yes, they had but, to pay to do this. But did they have internet? <laughs> that would be no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? The wow. cave had to be large enough to fit ten oh, people I get that. Wow. comfortably. How do you fit? It's like building a home, right? And how long you stay there? If I'm building a ten, pl- ten place house, I'm you staying know, the there for a month could, or at least. Do you think? I just don't think I could be comfortable. Inside, I, I guess you'd just be like, yeah, this is sturdy. But I would just always be yes. concerned about it coming down on you. you and know? who comes to well, – I, the, 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 the 10 – whatever, the 10 room. Yeah. I mean, who's coming over? <laughs> hey, all, all I can say hey is come that, to my house. You may freeze to death, but come on in. There's it, tougher people than me that live in Wyoming. It, it would yes. be. And you've seen Yellowstone, so you yeah. know yes. they're tough people. Yes, this is true. It was 20 – basically they were – Prepared for like twenty five degrees, yes. and, and they it was heated by candle. Yeah, I, I don't know what. Kind and of some of these people didn't know how to ski, right? So they had to teach them how to actually do ski everything to get up there. Do everything. It wasn't like they were, you know, prepared for this. A Broadway show called Good Evening, which was a hit um, at this time um, back in New York, and it starred a couple of actors: Dudley Moore, whom we all know. And uh, a, a, a only a little lesser known Peter Cook because he died so long ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, both these guys starring in, in the Broadway hit. And Peter Cook was, they're both British, but a big sports fan, Mark. Yeah, apparently uh, he, he predicted the Dolphins would be up 17 nothing in the Super Bowl against the Vikings. At the every, half. That, right, was at a, the half. that was in a dream. Yeah. He dreamed that. And, and everybody thought he was crazy. He laid the bet down, and he was right. Thanks to the Vikings almost scored at the end of the first half, but there was a fumble right. that prevented it and kept the dream alive. Yeah, he wasn't saying they'd be up by 17. He wasn't saying um, – he said 17 nothing at the half. It was really like he See, had some sort of premonition. But he, he should, did that also with that hor- – there was a yeah. horse race one where he said that he dreamed a long shot, you can fly would win. He looked it up under why it wasn't. It was under you – and the horse won a race. Right, right. It wasn't uh, Y-O-U for Y. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. But if he's psychic, he should have made more money. Well, yeah. He really should have. But yeah. a little background of Peter Cook is not many people know him. Like I say, he was a comedy partner with Dudley Moore, who obviously became famous when he came to the States and did 10 and all those movies. Arthur. In the 80, Arthur in the 80s. But Dudley Moore was a comic, too. And um, if you ever watch The Princess Bride, there's a, he played like the uh, Archbishop or something. It's a small role. 
but he's in there. Mm-hmm. But he was uh, um, he was very tall, 6'2". Dudley Moore was 5'3". So they were kind of like, you know, opposite ends right, of the right. uh, spectrum. But uh, he was uh, – um, he didn't age as well, I don't think, either. And that's, he died in 95. Yeah. So he was very they, Those young. two guys hosted Saturday Night Live. I just yes, they did. I had to pay for it. They I did. I think it was the first yeah, year. they were a host. Yeah, yep. him and Peter Cook. Yeah, uh, Cook died in 1995 oh. at 58. Right. And they did a movie together. So Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, when they were a comedy team, did a movie in the 60s, 1967. It was called Bedazzled. And who ah. was else in it? Raquel Welch. Welch, that's right. And, and then, then it was redone. Ah. I want to yeah. see the first one because I saw oh, yeah. the redone with Brendan, Matthew, Matt Fraser, Brendan, Brendan Fraser, Fraser, and, and uh, Liz Hurley. Right, right, right. I did not, when I saw that, I thought, oh, I'd like to see the first one because yeah. I, I wonder if you know, they wrote it. Be, they might have. The they might have to look it up. Yeah. yeah. But I also say that Cook was a big American sports fan, and he he always he said he would talk to his partner Dudley Moore, who thinks Zonka is a substitute for coffee. Yeah, wow. and then Cook had said that uh, of of um, Fraser, he said is sort of ugly and sings those awful rock songs. Ah, uh. and then Zonka Cook said, "Isn't that Zonka marvelous? All power and intelligence. Can that be his real name? It's almost too perfect for a fullback." But going for the Fraser thing. That's because Muhammad Ali had been talking, you know, with all the stuff that went on with Frazier. I think a lot of that seeped into people's, mm-hmm. you know, conscious. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Um, Padres were a horrible, oh. horrible team back then. Um, you think that they uh, had a rough season this past year. They oh. were just – they were looking to move. They were going to move people, to Tampa. People were, were – t- the proverbial move to Tampa. There was all sorts of teams that were moving to Tampa, but they finally get a uh, a new owner, Ray Kroc, who mm-hmm. buys the Padres. And I just want to these numbers that were thrown out in the article. Uh, he was worth five hundred million dollars because he was uh, not the original owners mm-hmm. of McDonald's, but, but he, he bought. bought McDonald's. He bought the McDonald's brothers out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they sold Watch the Michael Keaton movie. It's yes, a really good the story. It's a good right? movie. Uh, Very good movie. movie. Yeah. Sold 13 billion hamburgers. He owns a ranch in California, a palace in Florida, a $600,000 yacht, a $45,000 Rolls. And in terms of performance and attendance, the Padres were last. Mm-hmm. So he had uh, his work cut out for him. Right. And Ray Kroc later it was synonymous with the Padres. You couldn't think of the Padres without Ray Kroc and yeah. then his wife after he passed. But the Padres weren't his first choice. He wanted to buy the Chicago Cubs, yeah. and he actually went and kind of asked to see are they available, and he was told from the Wrigley family, no, they're not. No chance. So then he turned to the Padres. <laughs> yeah. And the beauty of the Padres was that they had those really what I considered ugly brown and yeah. yellow yeah. uniforms, and now I actually really like them. I'm glad they went back to the brown and, and gold because no other team has that. It makes them distinctive and stuff like that. But when they originally came up with that color scheme, I was like, ugh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he, he gave a lot back. He said money was not the driving force for him. He gave $7.5 mm-hmm. million dollars to charity, which back then is, you know. Said he didn't care about money. All, all. Yeah. Um, Nine million in stock back to employees at, mm-hmm. of McDonald's. Uh, he bought the company a new airplane for four and a half million, mm-hmm. and then leased it to the company for a dollar a year. So very philanthropic. Um, he said about wanting a baseball team, "I want a hobby." So my Some hobby, hobby is Stratomatic baseball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that doesn't make you millions no, of dollars. No, it does not. Uh, it does not. Um, but did you like that? Did you guys obviously read the part where he on opening night in 1974? When he won, he went to he wanted to address the fans, but just before he took the microphone, the Padres Matty Alou was double off first, and because he forgot there how many outs he was done, the Padres were trailing nine two at the time. So right after speaking, an incensed croc croc a croc abruptly veered from the script and said, "Fans, I suffer with you. I've never seen such stupid ball playing in my life." <laughs> <laughs> Over the microphone. That'll, I mean, that is, you know. That will inspire your team. Yeah. Yeah, but it probably endeared them to the fans. It did. Yeah. It did. Know? No one would do that nowadays. Yeah. Can uh, you name a, a, a great, before Tony Gwynn in 74, who was the best Padre player? William McCovey. No, I'm going to say. Nate Colbert? Yes, that's what I was going to say, Nate yeah. Colbert. Yeah, in, in that time, I mean, you know. And, of course, the viewers out there are going, Nate Colbert, who the heck is right. he? But there's only the one thing I want to say. He had talked about his McDonald's. 
And he said, every McDonald's operator is required to matriculate to the McDonald's University in Elk Grove Village. And he insists that all hamburger salesmen be neatly trimmed at all times with hair and fingernails cut short. Yeah, I was at they, a McDonald's the other day. They don't hold no, they don't it. Hold I don't it. think they went Mc, to the Mc, university. <laughs> McDonald's, when I was a kid, was my favorite. Me, me too. Favorite thing. I would ask my me dad too. every Saturday, can you drive me to McDonald's? And he'd go, oh, come on. Me too. So go somewhere else. I always McDonald's and get the Big Mac and the yep. fries and yep. the drink. Yeah. And they used to have ads. You could change for a dollar. Yeah. You know? And now, recently, I went to a McDonald's, and for a combo meal, it was like 12 13 yeah. bucks. Yeah. I was floored. Yeah. That's changed a lot. Riding high on a bull market. There's an article there on Rodeo. And I was thinking, you know, if we were the George Michael sports machine, we'd probably be all over this. But... Um, we're not. We could talk about Rocky. They weigh, they weigh as much as Rocky Mount, pounds. Mountain I Oysters. Yeah. The, uh, the, the Bulls. The Bulls, not yeah, the Riders. Not the Riders. No, the Bulls. That's, I thought, wow, that's that would That was a long article, too. It was. It was not a, now, you know, a couple that, pages. That would be the toughest athlete in the world, someone to ride those Brahmas. Well, when, I, w- when I did the, the, the blog in Vegas, I got to get the guy let me get the camera right down almost above where the Bulls were. Yeah, they're not happy creatures. No. He said, oh, he goes, just lean on the little oh, railing right here and get a their, shot. Uh, their yes. testicles yes. in a, in yeah. a yes. you know, like. And they rock back and forth, some of them in the cage. So I was sort of maybe right here to, you know, maybe three feet in front of me. There's this jumbo animal, and I'm getting this video, and he's sniffing and blowing and running, uh, you know, bouncing back and forth. And I thought, yeah, I don't think I'm getting on that. And someone gets on that, and there's no trouble. And they put one hand under the rope, and they're supposed to stay yes. on that. You know, for yes. six, seven seconds with one hand, it's just insane. I did it, and I did it in uh, Arizona with you. Right, on and, the electrical you know, one. Yeah, I think right? I did one second. Yeah. You know? No, I think you did one and a half. One and a half, hey, yeah. I'll I give that. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. No yeah. chance. Definitely not me if I no. fall down just right? walking down. Yeah, right, right. You wouldn't uh, make it to the bowl. I wouldn't. For the record, anything in for the record that you guys saw? I saw that Artis Gilmer won the ABA All-Star no. MVP, but Sven Nader, there's someone That's that I'm sure even, Mark yeah. enjoyed. Sven Nader. Yeah, uh, they lost, but he had 29 points and 22 rebounds in a losing effort. Homer Smith, named head coach at Army. Uh, he runs the wishbone offense. I think Army still runs the wishbone offense. Yeah, yeah. And then he, um, in later years, he came back and was an uh, offensive genius at UCLA. Yeah. It was back then. Yeah. And Billy, you got anything? I nope. don't. Nope. All right. How about this? Did you see Glenn Morris? You might know this, uh, Mark. He won a gold medal in the 35 decathlon. Uh, he passed at the age of 61. That's why he's in there. German filmmaker and document documentarian. Lenny Reifenstahl claimed oh, in her yeah. memoirs that during and after the 36 Olympics, she had an affair with Morris, which she mm-hmm. ended because of a very disparaging report about him that was given to her by a graphologist. Reifenstahl claimed that the affair began when, after winning the gold medal, he tore off her blouse and kissed her breasts in front of 100,000 people. I'm thinking, I don't know all 10 events of the decathlon, yeah. but I don't think that's one of them. I don't think it is. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, no one noticed. <laughs> right? Right? Dang. Uh, so that was, uh, we'll see. Morris later portrayed Tarzan in a movie and then played in the NFL for the Lions before becoming a naval officer in World War II. So wow, he did a lot. He, did yeah, a he sure lot. did. He did a lot. And then finally, um, I was reading the letters to the editor. What do you got, Billy? Oh, no, about the swimsuit edition? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the one person removed the offensive pages, destroyed the magazine, and they said, if you put another one of these out, I'm canceling my subscription forever. That was Mrs. George Brennan from Shamolan, Pennsylvania. She's not taking it anymore. She said her her husband ripped up the magazine, blah, blah, blah. But just 230 miles west in Pittsburgh, Florence Whalen wrote, I know you'll get the usual deluge of letters from outraged mother and narrow-minded people about your your article. The only thing I can say is that if my son gets to be 13 or 14 years old and doesn't look, I'll take him to a psychologist. <laughs> if my husband stops looking, I'll know he's dead. 
<laughs> so Florence and Mrs. George Brennan, just a little difference of opinion on the swimsuit issue. I, I wonder a what couple the, weeks the back. first lady would have thought about the issues years down the road. Yes, think of the Twitter <laughs> fight. Tell me the Twitter yeah. fight oh they'd have now. Yeah. Hey, that's the February 11th, 1974 issue with Ben, gentle Ben Crenshaw on the co- on the cover. Want to once again thank super 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 agent. I mean, literally, uh, you asked him the question about what's different about now versus then, and. The difference also has to be the competition because yeah, yeah. there weren't that many agents because right. of people like Lee Steinberg. That is now a – you can go to school to become a, a, sure. an agent Absolutely. now. That was not he the case. He could teach He that. could teach it. Yeah, I'm he sure could. he said he, he yeah. does. So yeah. uh, thank Lee Steinberg for giving us his time. Um, for Bill and Mark and Jeremy, that is the Past Our Prime podcast. We'll see you next week when John Havlicek is on the cover of – of the February 18th, 1974 issue. We'll talk with legendary Globe reporter Bob Ryan. Until then, I'm Scott saying goodbye. See ya. Uh,